Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my AM reading video for Friday, March 19th, 2021. I have less to talk about this week because a significant part of my weekly reading has been for the BookTube Prize, and still being mum on that as we have one more week left to go, but as the octafinals are winding down. <laughs> I will, in fact, be talking a little bit more about the Booktube Prize at the end of the video, but for now, I guess I will recap some fiction that I can actually talk about. <laughs> Starting with this one, this is Home Everywhere by Megan McNamer. I started reading it last week after picking it for my page 112 tag. Basically just had the ending left to go and don't have much else to say, just like I thought last week. I, I don't have much else to add. This is a short little book, very stream of consciousness, about um, a group of uh, travelers from the Seattle area who go on this uh, tour trip of an unnamed Asian country uh, with one of those, you know, paradise names that's unaffiliated at the top of it. Uh, and a lot of the narrative in this is actually more about their backstories, even, although we do get a little bit of them in Unnamed Asian Country, but uh, it's mostly very insular and doesn't tell us a lot about life outside of their experiences in the hotel and looking at, you know, a Buddha statue or two. And then we get into a little bit of uh, their backstories about who these people are uh, and maybe the sorts of... Um, internal drives uh, that would want uh, to make them want to travel. Uh, most of these characters only get um, a, uh, a chapter and it's really hard to pin them down and like really care about them too much. I mean you kind of get a little bit of an understanding of who they are within the context of the group. The uh, one character who is an exception is Irene. She's the one who has the most uh, time dedicated to her in past and present. So she's the de facto main character. I mean, it's a book that basically is trying to make the argument of uh, people looking for fulfillment of feeling home everywhere and uh, giving into an idea that I think is largely true in that, you know, we center ourselves in our own lives so that even when we are out in some, you know, foreign country, we're really still filtering things through our own experiences and not, you know, being completely outside of ourselves to experience another culture or what have you. But I still wish that McNamer had found more of a balance and, you know, stuck with characters who at least had some interest in this uh, culture and this country that was, you know, teaching them new things about the world beyond themselves. And I feel like uh, she just didn't do that enough and I uh, didn't care about the characters enough. The writing was really good and I appreciate Stream of Consciousness, I guess, for being more real because, you know, there's not all of that... Uh, intense focus on the narrative uh, because it's just sort of uh, people's impressions of uh, you know what's going on or random things they're thinking about uh, but yeah I mean I think uh, the major thing I can add after reading the ending is that uh, I I like this most for the travel aspects like the types of things they thought about on the airplane because that feels like the transitory part to me, where you're kind of connected to nothing in a way, and you know, you're brushing up against all these people from different parts of the world who have no business brushing up against. And that's kind of fascinating in that esoteric sort of way. But actually making it to your destination uh, should have a little more heft. That's uh, my major takeaway from this. It was an interesting experience, but it left a little to be desired. Woo, well, I rambled anyway, and the next book I have to talk about, I read all in this week and just finished it, or finished listening to it. I'm trying to show it on Libby here. This is A Desolation Called Peace by Arcady Martine. So anyway, A Desolation Called Peace was one of my most anticipated releases of the year that I talked about in January in a video. It is the sequel uh, to A Memory Called Empire, a science fiction work, uh, that takes place, uh, I would say, in the distant future. Humans have colonized distant uh, planets and space stations. Uh, and it's asking such questions as, uh, what is an empire and what does it consume of the places that it, in effect, conquers? And we get kind of uh, two stories with that. With a memory called Empire, it's about um, a ambassador from an independent space station, LaSalle, uh, going to Texcalan, 
Uh, in part, she's trying to solve a mystery about what happened to her predecessor, but it gets a lot into the weeds of how much Tex Kalani uh, culture has even infiltrated the cell and people like this woman, Mahit Dismar, who's the main character. And even though she's, you know, a stationer from the cell with their own culture, she has been falling in love with uh, the dictums of Tex Kalan because it's uh, just this all powerful and all encompassing uh, culture that really views itself as the center of everything and everybody else is a barbarian. And they have so much power that they just sort of, uh, you know, bring people into their orbit, as it were. And the second book has to do with uh, an alien uh, interaction with actual aliens. You know, the Tex Kalinitsum, uh, they call other humans who aren't from their, you know, conquered systems, they call them uh, barbarians and aliens, but now we're dealing with real aliens who are highly unknowable and actually also highly dangerous. So in a way, uh, the Tex Kalinitsum get a taste of their own medicine, of what it's like to be devoured, perhaps, uh, physically as well as, uh, you know, your culture and so forth being devoured. But in the meantime, Mahit uh, joins um, her uh, Tex Kalani, uh, basically companion and co-worker colleague, in trying to talk to these aliens, kind of a rival style, you know, in uh, trying to find a common language when you don't even make the same sounds. And it goes further into the idea of what is personhood and what is community, and uh, and we have various uh, POV characters in this one, all, I would say, trying to do the right thing in terms of waging war or trying to, you know, find a peaceful resolution and feeling sort of, I guess, uh, at the uh, victimized end of the stick for once, at least in Tex Kalan. You know, when it came to A Memory Called Empire, I think I compared it a lot to Byzantium because Arcady Martin was a scholar of the Byzantine Empire. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that Tex Kalan is, you know, based on the Byzantine Empire or solely based on the Byzantine Empire. It takes a lot of uh, inspiration, I'm sure, and then there's just all sorts of uh, stuff that I would assume is completely wholesale original, <laughs> having to do with alien uh, technology that no Earth civilization has yet anyway. <laughs> But anyway, I think the comp for A Desolation Called Peace is largely with the Aztecs of um, the, uh, the Texcalanitsum being like the Aztec Empire, and it's almost like the uh, interaction with the aliens is like their interaction with Cortez. That being said, I don't know if I want to go too far into that analogy, but it kind of gives a scope for how badly wrong things can go in terms of, you know, annihilation. But it, it doesn't, you know, follow that template exactly. That's just sort of a, an inspiration. And then there's all sorts of inspirations in this book. In fact, you know, the flagship that the Tex Kalinitsum have is called Wait for the Wheel. And when I first uh, heard it, uh, you know, through the audiobook, it made me think of Farscape, my favorite TV show, because there was an episode of Farscape, which also had to deal with uh, unusual alien interaction that brought up that phrase, wait for the wheel, as in, you know, sometimes your life raises you up and sometimes it grinds you down sort of thing. Uh, and I thought, you know, oh, it's like Farscape, but obviously it can't be Farscape that she's talking about, but it turns out that's exactly what she was talking about. That was her inspiration for naming the ship. And I found a, a tweet online I can link to where a very enterprising fan found a, uh, an essay that Martine wrote about Farscape and put together the pieces that Wait for the Wheel must be about Farscape too. <laughs> so that's pretty awesome. So yeah, I, I think this is a really powerful story in terms of, you know, like I talked I think last week about, you know, I went to epic fantasy for maximist storytelling and this is maximist storytelling for me where we can um, leave the earth but through these uh, alien and uh, future human civilizations talk about what culture means and what uh, civilization means and what community means uh, and what oppression means too. I guess to a certain degree, uh, I wish the characters felt more defined individually, although it might come back to the fact that the cultures are a little more communal in a way here. <laughs> And people feel very connected to uh, their cultures. 
it's easier for me to engage with characters, uh, you know, who have a little bit more of an uphill battle sometimes <laughs> and aren't always at the top of things. Martine also put in a character who is tex technically Texcalanitza, though he comes from a planet that uh, had been conquered, uh, like not like, you know, the actual Texcalan planet, but one of the planets that they conquered. Uh, and so for the most part, he's seen as, you know, Texcalan and like, you know, they've been almost completely subsumed, except that he kept his old religion. And I guess that made me think and probably maybe think too much about uh, the fact that Martine talks a, a little bit in interviews about uh, her experience as a Jewish woman, uh, understanding the idea of, uh, you know, f being compelled by a culture that is kind of devouring your own. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, maybe I'm not reading too much into that because I didn't read too much into the Farscape thing, so... <laughs> but yeah, I really liked this. I think I liked it better than the first one. Maybe because I'm more, you know, ingrained in the world now. Or maybe I like the fact that, you know, the super powerful empire was at a little bit of a disadvantage this time, and it's always kind of easier to, uh... I'm just saying that just stuck, stuck out to me. But, uh, by this point I feel like I'm rambling. Uh, I just finished the audiobook, just trying to get my thoughts out for my Goodreads review, which hopefully I'll be able to post soon. But yeah, overall, I really liked it. I think it's uh, probably going to go far this year in terms of uh, sci-fi awards. Speaking of books and awards and prizes that I myself have a part in judging, the next book on my docket is this one. This is Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents by Isabel Wilkerson. It is the final book I have to read for the BookTube Prize Octafinals. It is a book of uh, history and social commentary about uh, race in America, and, I th and it goes more broadly uh, from that into like caste stratification systems uh, that uh, cultures use uh, to keep each other to keep each other in place. Kinda, I guess, like the Tetzkalanitsum do with themselves and the barbarians and so forth. But anyway. <laughs> That is all I will be saying about this book here, because I am officially judging it uh, as part of Group F of the Book 2 Prize uh, Nonfiction Octafinals, but I will leave more information about the Book 2 Prize down below. So that about covers it for me now. Speaking of awards, I think I'll be back on this channel sometime next week to talk about the Goodreads Choice Awards, because apparently I'm getting more obsessed with those as well, so stay tuned. I was on this channel last night doing my author's answer video, talking about some of my plans for this weekend, which include attending a virtual uh, writers conference with the Eastern Shore Writers Association, so I'm excited enough to talk about that again and leave a link to them down below. <laughs> Another thing I have going on this weekend, really right after this virtual con ends is that I will be heading to Baltimore to celebrate the birthdays of my two parents. We had various things uh, come up that we couldn't uh, celebrate my mom's birthday in person in February, so now we're, you know, rolling it into my dad's birthday in March and just doing a dual thing. <laughs> so yeah, that should be a lot of fun, getting to catch up with my immediate family for the first time in a while. Realizing I've remained fortunate uh, in our era, our COVID era, of being able to see them in person with some regularity. Most of them, in fact, have gotten vaccinated or started to get vaccinated, and I haven't yet, uh, which is something they're starting to push me on a little bit. Uh, I think it's going to happen uh, relatively soon because I know that there's a push in general about uh, all adults uh, being vaccinated within the next uh, month or so. We'll see how that goes. But in the meantime, guess all is well here and hope all is well with you too. Thanks so much for watching everyone, and I'll see you next time.